Welcome to Deep Americana. Right on. So, Ken, um, so what do you what do you think about what what's going on in in our world today when it comes to racism, the protests going on, secret police, things of that nature? Well, I'll tell you what I don't want to get into, okay? Okay, okay. I don't want to get into some conspiracy theory that all these things were timed so well to be going on. Right, right, okay. I don't want to get into, a cons- you know, like for instance, we could say that Trump, the Trump presidency itself was a false flag operation. Right. And, you know, there's some mind control going on there. They got an implant in his head that they can text message memes into, like, drink bleach or whatever right I don't want to get into something like that I don't want to get into something that talks about like the umbrella man who was an agent provocateur that broke the first windows on the auto zone and uh, well hey we don't I do have a reference to that in a poem that I just (laughs) published on my Patreon this week Okay. patreon.com slash Kendall you can read that poem this week Okay. Uh, I don't want to get into a conspiracy theory that, you know, that the virus started from something that happened at Fort Detrick when the CDC closed Fort Detrick down in August, and that blaming China was just a cover-up and all this. And, and I don't want to get into that there's a bigger picture where, really, maybe because of the UFO phenomenon, which is being having disclosure right now, which right. I do the New York Times, which I don't want to get into, that all these intelligence agencies of our supposed enemies, and like the Cold War is like USSR or now China, that actually they all have a, a common enemy, which is the public. I don't want to get into that that they're actually working in cahoots on some of this and, and that there's all this conspiracy stuff and conspiracies within conspiracies. Right. Which may, which may all be true in different cases, but but we can't get into that because we got to talk about beautiful things. Oh, hey, hey, not, not a problem, kid. Because that stuff will ultimately fail. Right. Um, okay. The... Uh, What's more important is we we got to overcome it because on the on the on the, the the more common narrative, which is you know which is the Occam Razor's level of looking. Well, at how do stuff, how do we overcome all these things? Uh, yeah, well, we got to work at that common level, you know. Right. Um, you know, I recently, you know, I hate getting involved in this stuff because people can be violent and, you know, you put yourself at risk. No, yeah, 100%. Yeah, you know, like there's this, you know, one town that I have a history in where I did a lot of, I started an art festival with some people, this Will Underground Art Festival, Miami Local Arts Festival in Miami, Arizona. Cool. And on their message boards there in Globe, Miami, just all of this hate and racist stuff. Right. Because they can get away with it. Right. And uh, because, well, there's not really very many black people there, you know, a handful. So, I mean, there is the Apache tribe. So, it's all mixed up because Americans are really confused, you yeah. know, because every family's got some mixed race thing going on. They get, right. They don't, people don't even know who they are. And they right. confuse the, the colonial white European Spanish. Uh, a race from the, the real Mexicans and Native Americans, and there's a whole, you know, dichotomy there. But uh, but it, but at the same time, not because together they hybrid this incredible culture. And, right. Uh, it's all messed up. Who who thinks what? And I'm and so everyone's like, I'm not racist. But then they list off how they're against BLM and. Right. People with two hundred dollar sneakers, and all which are all racist dog whistles, and they, they just can't figure it out. They get all confused, you know. Right. But there's a meanness to it, so they know they're so they're, they, there's got to be some course correction there, you know. So I got on there on that site, and I did 
I did say, hey, big local employer, Freeport, Big Moran, the big mine in town, why are you letting your community talk like this? Are you, you must agree with it? I put some pressure on the big employer. Good. They saw it. I bet you this week there's been some changes. If we really want to address it, we need to start seeing, okay, all these message boards out there on Facebook or wherever, these, all this racist stuff's going, whether it's outright racism, calling for violence, or just hints and dog whistles, code, it is what it is, we know. We need to go on those message boards and and, and uh, tag the local big employers and say, so I take a year supporting this because you're sure not coming out with leadership against it. I was gonna, Ken, that's the best idea I've heard about this yet. Because these employers have leadership power. Right. And they have corporate vulnerability. Right. And, you know, everything is local, but that's where the, the wounds are and the festering. And the thing is, is you go... You go over to that mine in Miami that's still active. Company owns land here in Bisbee, too. There's still a big uh, dark force. You go over there, you can bet they have employees of every race and women and men, you know, and they may lean towards ones that coincidentally are more right wing because they kind of get vetted one way or another. I know more liberal people that have tried to apply to those places and somehow don't get the job, but. Right. You know, mining history has a dark history. Right. Because we had the deportation where they, by at gunpoint, deported 1,200 miners, separating them from their families because they were strike breakers or thought maybe to be sympathetic to it. And coincidentally, a lot, uh, most of them were dark skinned. And, uh, and they were Euro Eastern European, in some cases, or Mediterranean. And they, they put them on cattle cars and sent them to the middle of the New Mexican desert. Oh, wow. them if they came back, they'd get shot. The film Bisbee 17 addresses that. You can see me in a, as an as a actor and extra in, all throughout that in some short films. It's by uh, Robert Greene in one of the top films out there right now. It's called Bisbee 17. Hmm. But, uh, yeah, you gotta like take it to their doorstep because um, they need to. These companies need to provide leadership in the local communities because it is local. It's local managers that are hired from within, right. and and these cultures exist. That's why there's it's the same thing with the police departments. Right. Is you get these hateful subcultures, these you know dominated by bullies uh, that are dominating the local economy at the, at the local level. And we, you know, we say buy local, but there needs to be some discipline in it. And, and, and the truth is, is that, you know, if there's a large employer, the largest employers, you gotta put pressure on them to, uh, to, deal, to, to deal with the conversations that are happening in the local chat rooms, in the message boards, in the Facebook groups, on the Twitter feed, they need to provide leadership that, hey, you work here, that's not okay. And we, we're not just talking outright racism, we're talking all the dog whistles, right. all this, and it won't be easy for them because we've got Trump at the top of the megaphones spewing that shit. It, saying hey. it's okay to, you know, say you're going to do harm to this Imaginary Antifa or these BML people. Right. The other, Which is know, terrible. And, uh, but we got to do it. And, uh, and it's becoming more possible now. Uh, you know, and, and in fact, it reminds me of something I, I saw one political hack from the Democratic Party even saying in regards to the, all the voting problems going on in towns like Atlanta. You know, hey, Coca Cola's there. We're going to boycott you if you don't put pressure on the local government to quit gerrymandering and, and closing down voting stations. I mean, you've got situations like this in Kentucky where 
hundreds to thousands of voters at like two polling stations now. And they, Which is insane. You know, the same people that are saying COVID-19 is fake are saying, oh, we got to close them all down because of COVID-19. Yeah, you know? it's, it's the insane. The little sex and shit, the, yeah. the opportunism, particularly on the right. Oh, yeah. It, 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 it's just so awful, but it's time has come to end now, you know. <laughs> I hope yeah. so, because that is, it's just, it's terrible. It's like we're gaslighting people to be racist from our government. It's like, what, what is going on, you know? Like, that's yeah, not yeah, something I'm we sorry. need. You know, I know we all, we all get sucked up in these things. And there's right. Like, there's a lot of little rabbit holes where we can get sucked into that. And I see good people all the time getting sucked into it. Like, I noticed a few months ago they had, there was a, a video going around of this woman doctor who seemed very intelligent and, and uh, progressive, but she was arguing against COVID-19 and all these conspiracy theories that, against masks and all this. And within a week, I, I saw uh, half a dozen very powerful women I know get sucked into it. Right. Because that one got them. They got pulled down because they liked that woman. They got pulled into it. And I and then people don't like to admit they're wrong. And they, they go on these rides for a while. You know, if you join a cult, you can learn from it. But you only if you, it's, in six months, you get out of the damn cult. Deprogram and grow up. And then you got something out of it. Because you have a experience. But, right. You know, I, 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 people got to pull out of this thing they got sucked into. Uh, other ways that people get sucked into it is cancel culture because it is, you know, like, for instance, you know, I'm a white man, and it's true, you know, especially in arbitrary kind of art forms. I, I don't see it as arbitrary, but people don't know how to judge quality in art. And so in the arts, you know, where anything can go, more or less, to some degree, it's very easy to just say, well, uh, we'll just pick poets from this group. We won't touch any more white guys than we have to unless they're queer or something because, well, let's say what's good anyways. And I'm mean, not consciously plotting this, but just intuitively I think that happens. And it's true. If you look at the history of poetry, you know, or other art forms, one minute, and uh, other people of other races were, were kept out of it, and it was bullshit. Right. It was provincialism like we talked about before. But at the same time, now that rights or wrongs are being righted or whatever, and more opportunities are going around to, to people as they should, lacking a compass of what is quality, it's just easy to just... Uh, you know, throw in anybody and, and accept, you know, if you're a white, straight male or something. And, and, and it's, it's precarious times for us. So it'd be easy for you and me to get sucked into that rabbit hole of racism and all this right-wing stuff and Trump and all that because we have formed a resentment because we know we're, we're, we're not getting published or something. But let me back up from that. It's always been hard for people to be successful in those areas. It's all, whether they, even if they were a white male. And there's more poets and artists now than ever. Right. Which is amazing. But because the larger marketplace of consumer America doesn't give a shit about it, not enough money is trickling down, not enough money is coming from the middle class and the working class into the working class and middle class artists who haven't made it yet, essentially. So they're really, it's an illusion that I'm not making it because I'm white and all these brown people and, 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 and my fellow in, in queer people or whoever are getting the gold. Right. It's an illusion. The truth is it's always been that way. It's always just a few white guys that made it. Most didn't. There's a lot of reasons why you might not get noticed. For instance, you didn't live in New York City. <laughs> uh, right, right, right. Yeah. You know? Oh, there yeah. were always great artists all over the country, especially after the GI Bill, and there's these, these 
universities and colleges that had art programs, poetry, you know, and all this all over the country. So starting at least after World War II, or probably earlier, you had artists and poets and all these great minds all over the country because they could get teaching gigs there or because they went to school there. But, you know, got someone got pregnant, they stayed there and got a job as a teacher or a janitor or whatever. Couldn't move. And, uh, you know, so... It's always been that case, so I am hereby renouncing my resentment that I haven't made it because I'm a white male. (laughs) I'm not going to get sucked into the Trump thing or whatever with that resentment because it's always been hard and the truth is, is no matter how valuable my art and my ideas may be, I just haven't gotten out there maybe, you know. I had to wait tables every summer in Yellowstone for over 20 years, you know, and uh, I was always poor and getting knocked around the country, chasing cha- cheap rent until I finally got a good deal on my own place. And even then, I got to pay taxes, you know. Right. And so there's lots of me, you know, I'm, I'm one of those difficult artists, you know. Uh, you know, I have a difficult personality, I have my you know, sins. You know, and, you know, you know, Ken, I, I think what dictates someone being an artist is not the level of money in your pocket, right? What dictates the level of that is if you stay with that and just keep trying to do it. A lot of my favorite artists are homeless people and people that haven't made a dime. And guys such as yourself, you know? Yeah, well, you know, I'm actually doing pretty well, all things considered. But, and I do have some respect out there. But it's not like, I'm not a rock star. And it's kind of, right. you get a feeling like it's all or nothing in this business, you know? It's not. You're either, you're either selling your paintings for at least 10000 each, hopefully 20 at least. Right. Or, or, or you're, you're, or you're not selling them. Right. Right. But, you know, the, actually, you know, I'm in a situation where I can live off of a lot less than that because because I've set myself up in Bisbee where there's, where, you know, there's Sunset Acres area where artists are coming in and getting a cheap piece of land and being able to live on very little. Well, that's... I've lived on as little as 300 a month. Now, and I mean a lot of that, but other times I'm doing well because I'm selling paintings, you know, or, right. or, or my Patreon is, is paying my utilities at least, you know, and... That's awesome. The, uh, the uh, the, the good thing is is that you know you can live on that small amount the bad thing is though if you have a health crisis and you don't have health insurance or your van breaks down or the electricity goes out in your building oh, then, then all of a sudden that changes and you're in a crisis and, uh, right. and so at that point we gotta come <laughs> but, you know, but you know you know the cure to that is to build a community around you. And so that, you know, that if you do need help, maybe you've helped someone that'll help you, if that makes any sense. And that's not always gonna be the thing that saves you, but I think as as artists, it's our job to make art communities, to make things better. Yeah, it is, yeah, you're right. And that's true, and that's true for all humanity is, yeah. you know, all these fantasies that these militia guys have about civil war and all this violent stuff that people fantasize. And it's, right. It's dangerous because, you know, I have a whole philosophy of imagination when you get into regarding fantasy but, and, and, and action or decision making. But a lot of that, you know, it, it won't happen because, in fact, people come together as communities to survive. Which is, which is amazing. I was on the Mexican border. That even means on both sides of the border. Right. That we will be right. able to help each other. Well, no, that, that's something yeah, that, if, for if me, that you know, that's something that drives, drives me nuts, right, is that we're on a continent, and we have a border against Mexico and a border against Canada. And it's like, you know, what if we didn't have that border and we just open free, you know, trade within there? It'd be so much better. Well, it would be different. I mean, it'd be a different paradigm. Uh, I mean, to some extent, it was like that. But the border does right. exist in the human imagination, which is a very real thing. Right. No, because super real. For instance, when I go, I live a couple of miles from Naco, Sonora, Mexico, you know, um, uh, and uh, they 
are speaking Spanish over there, and we're speaking English over here. Right. Uh, but, I mean, they are speaking English over there when I show up, because I'm big, you have brain damage or something, you can't seem to learn the language. So right, I'm right. Chicago, but, right. Uh, and we're speaking Spanish over here. I'm in a, I'm in a choir right now, it's called the Binational Choir, mm-hmm. run by Lori Keene, who's a genius, and... Uh, We've had concerts on the border with stage on both sides of the wall. That's amazing. Sometimes a, a, a symphony, being, you know, played by conducted or one conductor with both sides, and dancers, and, and there's cultural differences in both sides' performances and right. different economic things going on. Which but, is phenomenal. But the Mexican consulate and the U.S. State Department had to cooperate just this got started before Trump, so, you know, even though they're building, they put, they put barbed wire all over the wall, and they're building the wall down here through the river, which is a mess, uh, but, but this was, this all happened, they realized that, that, so they're having to still deal with it, right now we're doing a Zoom concert, is what we're doing right now, right. and we've got uh, some uh, uh, opera singer and some other singers from Japan joining in, the thing about Zoom is you, you don't actually have to be in the, in the same town. You know? Right, so you're right. I just told a, a French composer, artist, and uh, opera singer about it. I'm hoping that she'll wire in. <laughs> no, man, that's that's phenomenal. That's mm-hmm. that's taking the situation we're in and doing a positive with it. And that's, you know, I feel like instead of thinking negatively about having to wear a mask or, you know, think about COVID, you know, try to turn it into a positive. For me and you, I'm a hermit. So I make art, <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, that's, that's a good thing, you know. Yeah, man. That's a good thing because artists, they have to do the work, you know. And if, if some of these techniques will take a long time. I have, I have some painting techniques that just take me forever. I have paintings that took several well, years. You, I go yeah. back and forth to it. Well, you I know, have techniques that go very quickly, you know. It just the, depends. The, the piece as the, the clouds and the drug deal that I did, it's called No Shirt, No Shoes, No Classism. That was about a month long painting. This yeah. concert caverns piece, like a lot of the 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 more simply rendered stuff, is so fucking hard for me to do, because I'm used to render. Uh, I want to render it high, you know, in in full depth. Um, that it's an experiment and it trips me up. This is also a three foot by two and a half foot piece, so it's huge. Yeah. But yeah, but you do know to go until you. Or your feeling or something finally tells you it's finished. I, I do. My problem is a lot of times I don't know when to stop. Here, as of late, I do a bit more. I'm, I'm getting to the point that I'm sick of this piece. <laughs> I have another piece I'm working on, and there's a lot of illustration that I would like to start working on, too, because I have a heavy hand in illustration. But, yeah. Well, yeah. well Ken... Oh. Is there anything you want to add? We're almost at about an hour. And we, okay. we can well, keep going if you want. But we can go a little bit. I have to go meet my other assistant. But, hey, you know, would you want to read? There's a lot to cover. I mean, you've just brought up some things that are important. You know, like I was going to say, would you want to read some here? I was looking at this painting on the wall. It's a, okay. If you want to call I mean, it's a painting, but it's, a, uh, it's built into a, a panel. Right. With plasters and then waxes and then oil paints and there's also a found object cemented into it a a crushed aerosol can i use crushed cans a lot which are is is that what is is that the one that looks like a heart no no you haven't seen this one the one that you describe as a heart is an oil on canvas that is i love that piece yeah, and that's got some of my whip painting technique in it. This other piece is is my, from my effigy series that has, in, you know, these encaustics and oils, and there's actually a little nail, a metallic nail polish in it. And, and, uh, but it, it, and I cast shadows from the objects to create a basic abstract form so that it's an abstract form, but it's coming from nature, or I might add scribbles or automatic drawing in some cases, and uh, which is what the heart shape is in that other piece, and that's a hybrid piece, you know. But the, uh, I was just looking at this today thinking, 
I'm not satisfied with it. I've said that many times looking at it. And so it just keeps sitting around, but I, I, I realize I'm going to do a clear coat over wax over it and start working it again. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, most of the time I, I reach a sense that it feels finished. Um, once in a while, like this piece, I just had to stop because I just didn't know, right. you know, and, uh, my poetry, very difficult situation in that way. Because I will rewrite poems for years, and I'll think that I feel it's done, and then the next time I see so many problems, because language is so layered with so many multiple meanings to each word, and, and sentence construction, and all these different things. Right. Uh, very difficult. And, and I boxed myself into that corner because of the difficult abstract and yet representational hybrid technique or form that I'm trying to create in my poetry. Okay. Is there if any... I just, if yeah. I was easier on myself, I would have said, okay, I'm just going to be an image poet and have some nice images and otherwise simple, or be a formalist and you just go by the form, you know, iambic pentameter or sonnets or whatever. But no, I never could make my life that easy. I, I, I am still inventing that form that I do. And I, you know, I, and, uh, but I'm not ashamed of it. You can't be shamed on this stuff, you know? Mm. You know, and the truth is there are traditions of writing, like playwriting, where they workshop that thing for years. Right. You know, like, uh, what's his name, uh, August, um, playwright with was successful, would have his plays traveling from town to town across the country, would rewrite the play again every city that it was produced in. Okay. That's and, awesome. Uh, and, and that's okay. And, and I think Bach was said to do that with his music. Uh, you know, it's okay. And, he, and in a sense, you could say that each different version of the poem is a variation on a theme. If it turns out it wasn't as horrible as you think it was. You didn't destroy it, the old version, you know. Right. Um, Do you have any you know, poetry that's, that's you might want to share? Area to to conclude with is how we how we conclude a composition. You know. Hey, Ken. Do you have any poetry you might want to share with us? You know, I didn't think about that. Um, maybe what I could do is read that poem that I was that I mentioned since I mentioned it. Yeah. I think it'd be it's awesome. On Patreon if I get my computer to wake up here. Yeah, go for um, it. Um it is it, I don't like to write political poetry. Right. But then like I think it was Adorno said something about you know, everything's political, you know. Uh, but that's that's making a rhetorical point. So it is it is, but I think, like, at WSU, when I was learning under Ron, one of his big things was he was like, you know, if you do politics and religion in your art, you're going to split your audience. And so I think a lot of people have been taught to shy away from it. Yeah, well, that's a good point. And so I never have. <laughs> you know, he, for me, that's not the reason. The, the, right. For me, the reason has to do more with the didactic patterns and language and, and, and imagery uh, the yes. answer, you know and the false dualities I'm more interested in doing art that breaks the illusion of, of these false dualities and these contradictions you know and, and what, a more kind of dialectical process um, and that's that's hard work I mean just think about it then you gotta start figuring out how you're gonna do that um, right. the, uh, but, it, but sometimes, so, because I'm not, so I'm not doing it, I'm not not doing it for the sake of, you know, of avoiding offending my audience. Right. You know, I, uh, they need to know better. I'm, I'm not, the reason I avoid it is because it, that's, in a sense, that's just one kind of trope. Uh, and by the word trope, I mean like figurative language or, or schema, image schema in, in, in language and image. 
Now, this poem might be appropriate, though, because it kind of covers all these things. Okay. I mean, uh, the, I'm, I'm trying to write two poems a week because, and that's a lot of work for me, the way I write, and all the many drafts. But I figured if I wrote two poems a week, then in 10 years I'd have a thousand poems. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> Good luck. But it's to make up for lost time, probably. But not, and to, and to really give me where I need to be. And it has helped. Uh, but it's hard. Well, practice and, uh, makes perfect, man. Work. But, so this, this week's group was the anonymous zone, I called it. Okay. And that's kind of a, a play on words with this something in this poem that's something we talked about earlier. And this poem I titled Stage Directions. The river fasts, but she feeds the fowl with the hidden feast of the falls, putting one log in front of the other. So consider yourself as the man who was kicked out of town, cold currents of the promised land, the foot where the mountain slid down. The edges of the river were littered with symbolic acts. No particular cast, audience, or crew. The set is like a child wandering through the bottoms, daydreaming. You see where the river tore away the institutions. It's important to keep poor people poor, keep them ignorant, sick, anti-intellectual, and who is stage left, and who is stage right, breaking glass across the auto zones of America. So there you go. That was fucking amazing. And that has uh, what you might call several different prosodies in it, because a prosody is a type of form of poetry. Uh, that's the traditional use of the word prosody. Now it also often refers to software programming. But so prosody, like for instance, uh, a sonnet is a type of prosody, and then there's different types of prosodies you can have in different kinds of sonnets, Italian sonnet or Shakespearean, right, or made up or what have you. Uh, then there's other different things that you would talk about in prosody, like rhyme or alliteration. So in this one, the poem starts out with a the first verse has a lot of alliteration. The second verse has some rhyme. And uh, I, don't, I didn't bother to count if it's iambic pentameter, but some of it might be. That often just imitates a, a certain natural cadence, or at least Anglo speech. Um, so the third verse is almost more prose like with longer lines, and it's a little more intellectual. And then the last verse is just doing its thing, you know. I guess just the poem really is swung into its own voice by then, a hybrid of the previous prosodies, whether it's pre verse or not. I don't know. You know, you, you can get into arguments about what these things are. Like, my, there's a great local poet here, Michael Gregory, who just published a book called Pound Laundry. And uh, he's also a local environmentalist. He'd be a good one to interview. He, 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 he argues with me. He gets upset if I put certain technical language in a poem, especially if it's a, one, one that was grammatical, technical language. And, uh, and he'll argue if there's no such thing as free verse or something. I don't know. I'm not just But all those things are relative, you see. And uh, so... Um, you know, uh, I like this poem I wrote this week. It actually took uh, several weeks to write it because it it did kind of hybrid all these different techniques into one poem, verse by verse, mm-hmm. until it got to its place, you know. Well, isn't that kind of when we're experimenting? experimenting? John Boyd, I don't know if you knew him at WSU. Then, yeah, I he was my so. he I, was my printmaking I professor. An image of him in my in my well, mind. I don't said Facebook. Maybe he's in my Facebook. He's now. he's dead now. But yeah, yeah. he uh, at one point, you know, you can imagine. I probably had I had pretty wild styles, <laughs> and uh, I would come in there real wild eyed. He goes, Ray, if you're gonna do things that seem random or that are experimental, 
he goes like if you're gonna go and you're gonna take this etching board and you're gonna rub it on the cement you need to do that a lot so you can learn how to use that if that makes sense and I, I think when we start practicing and imbuing these experimentations after a while we can have a different form or, or make it look so right so effective right and so in place yeah yeah so they, well, they, there's that cliche that you gotta have your 10,000 hours and something oh, yeah man like and there's, there's yeah. some sense to that and, and um, but you, you know having your 10,000 hours of experimentation is almost a contradictory version of that but it's, right. yeah, it's, yeah. it's pretty cool yeah, I mean, used to be a, a boxer who was an artist, and I think he sold his paintings outside of Wichita. He used to hang out at the Riverside Coffee Shop over okay. there. Is that, is that the name of that? Um, it was called the Perk, is what you're talking about. Yeah, there. yeah. So he uh, he used to talk about how he made the analogy between drawing. He'd always be drawing all the time, and he'd be drawing these weird things. And it was, Jim, it was practice like when he had been a boxer, where you have to constantly practice. Right. And, uh, and that analogy holds some water, you know. And, uh, but for those of us who started out in brutal adolescence, rebelling, and slowly developed our over or what have you, uh, it's a longer road, but it's, in the end, maybe an incredible road. Oh, yeah. And, I, and, and so I encourage any, like, rebellious young people or old people that are still haven't gotten over it they, even if you start out like refusing so much because we'll refuse to learn things we'll, mm -hmm. you know you still were doing something so still take that and now maybe uh, take the time and, and learn some new things and something remarkable may come out of it because there's still you still got your 10,000 hours of being a bitch or a punk or whatever you know you can put something of that into it you know like my my art system is uh, is a great is, is kind of has been developing her pastry art she has her own old bakery business and there's a fondant or something like that's what it's called where you you put the icing and make flowers on a cake for instance or something mm -hmm. there's a little tube and different implements and I I think I even got one of these kits because I'm saying, hey, we need to have you put some of your intuition and knowledge and experience from that into your experimental paintings you're going to be doing. Right. Because that's transferring some of that 10,000 hours from somewhere else right. to make up for missed time into this other thing. Right. And I, I think there's a lot of making up for missed time that we do just intuitively from the other things that we were doing. And that's good. And that, that can help us finish a piece. Right on. Help us see when it's, when it's time to end the podcast. <laughs> right on, man. Well, I, I think we this has been a very uh, amazing interview here, Ken. Uh, well, thanks a lot. Maybe we'll do it again. Yeah, we, we and, can. Uh, we can. We're and, about... Uh, best of luck with the podcast. I appreciate your diligence in following through. Thank you for listening to Deep Americana.